everyone. Thank you for joining us online here at Destiny. If you haven't had a chance to visit our campus, we would love for you to come out to either our 930 or 1130 service on Sunday. But if you can't, you can always watch us online here at destinyokc.com. And while you're there, you can look up any past messages, see any of our upcoming events, and read pastor's blogs. Also, be sure to follow us on social media right here. And now, here's this week's message. Why don't you have a seat and let's uh, step into deeper waters as we explore this just a little bit further. I'm going to just tell you right up front and caution you in this moment. I'm going to talk about something that's a bit painful today. I'm going to talk about complaining, the spirit of complaining and what that really looks like. Um, Tracy and I have on many occasions experienced different cultures and different perspectives and and come home to the u.s in different uh times just saying thank god for where we live aren't you thankful that you live where you live that you were born where you were born and i mean we have so much to be grateful for in the freedoms of our land and so much to be responsible for in the freedoms that have been entrusted to our care in the wealth and the power and the influence that has been entrusted to our care. We were celebrating the freedom, but when I said responsibility, it kind of went flat. Aren't you glad and aren't you ready to celebrate with responsibility all that God has entrusted to our care? I mean, this is important that we understand it. It's a significant element and dynamic. Too much is given, much is required. And so we, we've realized that and, and talked about that at different times. I've thought about um, even a, a really wonderful place to go in the UK. You know, we were in England and I was in this restaurant and and I said to the guy that I was with, I need to run to the bathroom, where's that? And he goes, oh, well, you go down the stairs and you walk out the back into the alley about five buildings down and on your left you'll find uh, the bathroom. And, and I was thinking, I am in a restaurant and there's not a bathroom in a restaurant. You realize that it's against the law in the United States of America. And so uh, I'm, there's not a bathroom here. So I go down the stairs, go out the back, and I walk down the, the alleyway, and there is this, like a bathroom shack. It is a one-room, no-amenities bathroom shack with a line of people from other restaurants standing in line waiting to get into the sh and I'm, I'm standing in this alleyway, and, and finally, you know, I'd been there a little while, and somebody said something and asked me a question, and when I responded, they could tell that I had an accent. I was a foreigner in their land and so the lady in front of me strikes up a conversation and asks it where I'm from and, and we had a jovial little chat pip hip uh, through the conversation there waiting to get in the bathroom so she goes in front of me and when she comes out <laughs> she walked out and she walked right up to me and again now a big line behind me and she hits me with her elbow and she goes I left the seat up for you <laughs> and I said well thank you but what if I wanted it down <laughs> Uh, I'm so thankful to live in America. I'm so thankful that we have so much to be thankful for. Some people have such hard lives, and seemingly their lives are not that hard. They do pretty well in some pretty complicated circumstances. Some people have really easy lives, and seemingly they're the most miserable, wretched people that exist in the world. Life's never about what happens to you. A lot of things are going to happen to you. How many of you had things happen to you? Life's never about what happens to you. Life's about what happens in you when things happen to you. And when the right things are happening in us, then no matter what happens to us, praise comes out of us to the Lord our God, giving thanks in all circumstances. Very important that we understand this today as we continue in this focus and, and talk about something that is utterly demonic complaining and I just believe the Lord's going to convict our hearts he's been convicting my heart all week long I'm I'm in general a really jovial positive person uh, but how many of you know a spirit of complaint sometimes shows up in a manipulative way and you can't necessarily see it for what it is on the outside I believe God wants to deal with something deeper in our hearts how many of you are willing to allow the Lord to go there today like really willing some of you um, would say you know I, I have a tendency to complain some of you are already complaining about a complaining sermon I mean that is making you complain it's the table of demons is what we're talking about and the context of this actually is about complaining it's really interesting this is the verse we've been looking at first Corinthians chapter 10 verse 21 you cannot drink from the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too 
You cannot have part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. It's amazing. Each week we've looked at a different um, depiction or expression of that which is demonic that we read about in Scripture. And, and we don't necessarily even see it that way. But it's just like when Jesus looked at Peter and Peter was using rationale and logic and he said, you know, I don't want anything bad to happen to you. And Jesus said, that's demonic. It's logical. It's understandable. It's justifiable. It's compassionate. And it's demonic. Get behind me, Satan. You don't have in mind the things of God. You have in mind the things of man. So the demonic origin of that which is human in our rationale and our logic sometimes takes us captive. And we don't even realize what's going on. So by the Spirit of God, under the sound of my voice, may the, may the, the Holy Spirit begin to quicken and awaken things within us that need to be dealt with on a deeper level today. Myself at the front of the line. Amen. If you agree for it and you receive it down deep in your heart, would you just say amen? amen? Context of this particular text is really important. The table of demons. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 10. If we just go a few verses earlier in verse 10, it says, do not complain. The Bible says, don't do it. Do not complain. Well, I don't like this and I don't like that. And this needs to be that and that needs to be this. Do not complain. As some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer complaining leads to destruction that's what we're reading here <laughs> complaining leads to destruction and then we read on it talks about you can't drink from the cup of the lord the cup of demons you can't eat from the table of the lord and the table of demons in other words you can't complain and praise god at the same time so you've got to make a choice of what you're going to do when you use your voice, isn't this amazing? Psalms 22.3 tells us that God inhabits the praises of his people. That's an amazing a portion of scripture. That is phenomenal reality. When you praise the Lord your God, when we begin to sing, not just getting through the, 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 the songs, but when we sing, engage our heart, really worship the Lord, God inhabits the praises of his people. That means your voice actually is a God-given resource to awaken that that's taking place in the spirit realm. That means when you believe in your heart and you use the sound of your voice to declare Jesus is Lord, you're awakening that in the spirit realm, getting God's attention. This is a beautiful reality. The praise that comes from your mouth awakens the spirit realm. And the complaining that comes from your mouth awakens the spirit realm. Your voice is a God-given resource that God gave you to awaken and activate the spirit realm around you. Be careful. As praise will attract the Lord your God and draw you to the table of the Lord, complaining and criticism will attract the enemy and draw you to the table of demons. Understand what I am saying in this and what God is revealing in this. The devil was cursed in the book of Genesis to crawl on his belly and eat dust. Your body was formed from dirt. Your flesh is devil food. Let's walk through this together. When man sinned, God cursed the, the serpent to crawl on the belly and eat dust. The Bible says this very specifically. The devil eats dust. He's cursed to crawl on, crawl on his belly and eat dust. You and I were formed, Adam was formed out of the dust of the earth. And Eve came from the rib of the man. Ultimately, the origin of humanity is the food that the serpent now eats in a fallen world. I'm saying to you that it is your carnality and your fleshly appetites and your justifiable disposition that leads you to a complaining spirit that takes you right to the table of demons. And guess what the food is at the table? Your flesh. Mark this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. This is really interesting because this 2 Timothy reveals, you, you probably don't realize there are this many, 19 characteristics of people that will turn away from the table of the Lord. 19 characteristics. That's what this is talking about. Paul is exhorting Timothy. 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 5. But know this, in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves. It's easy to hate others when we only love ourselves and give no consideration to the people around us. Men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unthankful. 
unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. And from such people turn away. I want to point out to you the first thing that we read in this sewer pipe of garbage is lovers of themselves. Men will be lovers of them. This is the sewer pipe from which all garbage flows. Have you ever known anybody who was a lover of self? All they ever do is talk about why things aren't working out for them the way they want them to work out for them. They can't stop talking about themselves because they can't stop thinking about themselves because they are a lover of themselves. If you're afflicted with this disease today, I want to say to you, repent and allow the Lord to heal you because this is a sin. This is a chief issue that we must address in our own lives. You have to recognize that any of us that only focus on ourselves are embracing the prescription for depression. If I spend a lot of time just looking in the mirror, just examining myself, just looking at myself, I'd just be examining every flaw, evaluating everything I didn't like about the way I looked. I would be wishing I had more hair. I would be wishing, I mean, there would be all kinds of things that I would be thinking about as I'm just looking in the mirror, focusing on myself. I don't know if you understand or not, but you are actually not designed to fix your eyes on yourself. You are designed to fix your eyes on Jesus. Get Get your focus off yourself and put your focus on the Lord your God who is risen from the grave and wants to activate and awaken something profound and significant in your heart today. Amen and amen. We're designed to stare at him. Lovers of self. It's where it all begins, where it all flows from. If you're proud, this is this part of the 19 characteristics. If you're proud, what are you proud of? Yourself. If you're a lover of money, why are you a lover of money? So that you can spend it on yourself. This is really interesting. And, and somewhere along the journey, I just stopped being the least bit inhibited about talking to people about their finances and about God's plan for uh, giving is worship. Somewhere I stopped being inhibited by that, regardless of what anybody may want to say. This has just always been a part of God's plan for worship. And it's because he's trying to deliver you from you, and he's trying to deliver me from me. And so it's really interesting how it works, because giving is God's plan to confront yourself. And it keeps you constantly in check. Every time you increase, the Lord says, take a portion of that increase. He calls it a tithe. And bring that into the storehouse. That's the place where you're spiritually fed. And as you release that in the storehouse, it breaks the spirit of materialism off of your life. And I would encourage you, figure out how to give in a way that is worship in your heart. You can text a number. You can find the, the box. You can do it doing worship. You can do it at home as a part, as a family, around communion. Whatever it takes, I challenge you, make sure your giving is an expression of worship and not some sense of duty or obligation. Because if you're doing that, you're only giving to reprieve yourself from feeling guilty. And you've missed the whole point. The Bible speaks of this day where people won't go to church looking for how they can use their gift for transformation and encouragement. People will shop churches to find the best product that will meet their need the way they want their need to be met. I'm just going to tell you something that might be a shocker to you, but in our culture, we need to wake up to the fact the church is actually not here to meet your need. I know that's surprising to some people, but the church does not exist to meet your need, Christians. We are the church and we gather together and exist to transform society, meeting the needs of people around us. That's the purpose of the church. 
Does that mean your needs don't matter? Of course not. We as family minister to each other in that process, but our ultimate objective is not to produce a commercial product that will attract more people in and we can meet more needs. If all we're doing is getting people to attend church without truly making disciples, then we're only contributing to the greater problem of disillusionment that exists in society with the body of Christ. I need to breathe just a little bit. Holy Spirit, would you just do in us what only you can do? Already there's all kinds of justification that starts happening in the complaining spirit heart. People pointing fingers and thinking of somebody who they wish could hear this message. And in a sense, they're complaining they're not here. They're complaining they're not hearing it. Help us, Lord, to understand just how slithery and tricky the enemy is. Any bit of flesh we provide becomes a feast for him to behold, taking us down a path that we will regret that we have gone. Years later, waking up, realizing we have infected everyone around us with our toxic attitude that was never truly yielded and surrendered to the cross of Jesus Christ. Deliver us from that, Lord God, I pray. In Jesus' mighty name. There's going to be this migration, the Bible says, away from any form of gratitude. I can't value and appreciate what's been entrusted to my care because I'm so interested in what it is I don't have. Life's not about having the most of what you want. Life has never been about having the most of what you want. Life has always been about making the most of what you have. What God's entrusted to your care, start there. Giving thanks, using that to the best of your ability, being a steward of that which you possess. Instead of lusting and longing for that which is seemingly beyond your reach, it's amazing what happens when you get your priorities right and you start expressing this gratitude but did you read it one of those 19 characteristics that they'll be complaining that'll go on there'll be no gratitude being offered there'll there'll be no thanksgiving being expressed why can't the church do more of this and why can't the church do less of that and I wish in my group this would happen and I want that topic here and I if I could only go get this taking place and where's the kids ministry doing this and what about the music can you turn down the music can you turn up the music it's too cold in here it's too hot in here these are the conversations that I've been having from people for 21 years of leading the church when we built this building I had people come and complain about the way we were building the bathrooms we need a unisex bathroom pastor and maybe we need to get a bathroom that allows a dad to be with babies in the room I I don't know what their reasoning was you know it's irrelevant (laughs) what you have to understand is we can give thanks and have a good-hearted attitude if we're willing to do so and if we don't our lives begin to crumble into a state and a mindset and an attitude that is utterly destructive to us and to those around us. That's why the Bible says, turn away from these kind of people. It's not about church. Complain about my house. Complain about my car. Complain about my wife, my husband, my kids, my job. Instead, I'm so thankful I've gone from death to life. I mean, I, I used to be dead. I, I was blind, but now I see. I used to dwell in darkness, and now, like, I am forever changed. I'm never going to be the same. Are you kidding me? My life is that God has placed gifts within me to use those gifts to serve the people around me. That's the life I get to live. That's what God has designed us for. Are you kidding? That's what we get to do? That is amazing. Are you complaining Or are you believing? 
Because you can't do both. Are you complaining or are you believing? Because to complain is not to believe. Complaining about something is being a thermometer on a wall. This is what is happening, and this is what the temperature is. This is what is happening, and this is what the temperature is. You were not designed by God to be a thermometer. You were designed by God to be a thermostat. This is what is happening, but this is what God says. Therefore, I will change what is happening, and this atmosphere is subject to control of the power of the living God. If I will get my voice right, then I'll begin to change this situation. I will not dwell where I have been, holding me back in times past. I'm, I want us to really engage in this last thing that I want to share with you. I, there are two things that for a few months I've been meditating on. And I've just been asking the Lord, where am I supposed to share that? And I'd like to tell you, if there's somebody that has come to mind that you're considering inviting to come attend a church service to join us online... One week from today would be a really good day to do that. There's been a specific thing that I've been just meditating on for probably three months or longer, and I felt like the Lord was saying, next Sunday is, to, is when I'm to bring that. So I would encourage you just to think about who might come to mind, particularly on a day where we're going to be having our you know, celebration that evening from 5 to 8. Uh, it would be a great morning for somebody to show up and for you to have them here. I think they'll find uh, what I'm going to be sharing very encouraging, whether they're unchurched, dechurched, non-believers or believers. I, I feel like it's a significant word. I feel the same about what I'm about to say to you. I'm asking if the worship team would just go ahead and make your way up and I'm gonna let them all get in place even before I start to tell you this because I want us to press right into a place of worship with it and I also just want you to really be focused in on what I'm about to say because it's pretty wild. It's just a total challenge to the common disposition raise your hand if you are convicted about complaining this morning can i just see just raise your hand up there lord just do a work in all of our hearts i pray in jesus mighty name in jesus mighty name isn't it funny how trace and i over the years we would hear somebody get a prophetic word or you know you you hear somebody hear something and you think, oh my goodness, that really spoke to their situation. They're going to be really convicted about that. And then when you ask them what they heard, like they heard something totally different. And it, you, how many of you know we, are, we have a very subjective process of hearing? It really takes the Spirit of God to break through a shell that fights against God. The Bible says there's hostility within us that fights against the Lord. And we have to break that. The simple mind is hostile against God. It doesn't submit to God. So only by the Spirit can we step into this. So I just would invite you to, number one, allow the Lord to awaken something from, from what we've talked about and then recognize the significance of what I'm about to share with you. There's this verse of Scripture in Numbers chapter 14, verse 9. And it says, you, you do realize the, um, the Lord prepares a table for us in the presence of our enemies, right? Notice this, Numbers 14, 9, when they're debating about the giants in the land, do not rebel against the Lord and do not fear the people of the land for they are <laughs> bread for us. I've just been reflecting on this now for weeks and weeks. Don't fear the land, they are bread for us. Their protection is removed from them and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Don't complain about the giants in the land. They are bread for you. Don't complain about the giants that you're facing. They are bread for you. See, what you have to understand is when you find yourself facing opposition of a giant that stands before you, that giant will many times captivate your attention and hold your attention captive. God's not even really looking at that particular giant in the form of the giant. He's looking at the next 
battle that you're destroying this giant is going to nourish you to a greater place of strength to step into the next level battle that he's preparing. Your giants are bred for you. Your giant is your next meal. Come on, let's stand. Do not rebel against the Lord, and do not fear the people of the land, for they are bread for us. What kind of adversarial circumstances are you facing right now? Because it is bread for you. Goliath wasn't standing before David because God sent him to defeat him. Goliath was standing before David because God sent him to promote him. And in that moment, he would go from being an obscure shepherd boy who nobody knew to becoming a national hero that fast. That enemy was bred for him. God was using it to nourish him to step in to the next dimension of his call. Will you manage your enemies correctly? Will you manage your enemies correctly? Will you begin to view the opposition of your life correctly? You've been looking at it all wrong. If you've been complaining, make the choice to rejoice. That enemy, that adversary that is before you is bred for you to digest, to strengthen you and nourish you, to step into another dimension of what the call of God is on your life. We want God to give us strength for the battle, but God gives us strength from the battle. Come on, let's give him thanks. Let's give him thanks. He's giving us strength from the battle. kingdom authority is born from humility you think you're being strong when you're using your voice to make a point over different situations that are born from being self-absorbed but you're not you're demonstrating just how weak you truly are in the kingdom of God or do we repent because in God's kingdom authority is born from humility so we humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord. And my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. Lord, in a place of humility, we stand before you and we say, you're God. We're broken. We need you. Just because we're saved doesn't mean we're not stealing. With, we're, not, we're not still dealing broken areas of our lives that you're working to mend. Thank you, Lord. We're on this journey of becoming more who you've called us to be every step of the way. So we get into your word and we truly treasure your word and acknowledge your presence in the way that you've designed us to. Something within us starts to be transformed. A mechanism within us begins to be ignited. We thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You're the Savior of the world. Aren't you glad Jesus came to rescue you and redeem you from your sin? Come on. If you believe in your heart, why don't you confess with your mouth, amen. Jesus is Lord. We acknowledge it, Lord. We acknowledge it. Maybe some people are acknowledging that for the very first time. Just step into that place where you surrender your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Welcome to the lifelong journey of making Jesus Lord. For none of us have it all together. Sometimes we get upset when we figure out we don't have it all together. But we just bring it back to the foot of the cross again and again and again and again. Allowing the Lord to redeem and restore in profound and significant ways. Causing us to become more of who he's called us to be. Ah, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, do a deep work within us, I pray. Do a deep work within us, I pray. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I want to ask you uh, for an action point this week to correct yourself every time you complain. Purposing to feast at the table of the Lord. You ever put one of those rubber bands around your wrist and popped them? I'm not suggesting that, but correct yourself. I watched my dad once. He had a taser in his pocket. Accidentally tased himself. It's the funniest moment of my whole life. I don't recommend you do that, but correct yourself. If that's what you got to do, do what you got to do. Correct yourself this week. Every time you catch yourself complaining, correct yourself. Tell somebody. Admit it. You've got to confess your sin one to another. Don't cover it up. Don't justify it. You just don't know what I grew up like. You don't know what I'm dealing with. You don't know. Don't justify it. Uncover it. Expose it. Ask the Lord to heal you from it or you'll just live with it for the rest of your life. Correct yourself this week. One of the best ways I correct myself is I tell on myself. Tracy has to hear it often coming to tell on myself. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be delivered from this complaining spirit that your word says will prevail so significantly in the latter days. We'll draw people in a justifiable disposition to the table of demons where the very flesh and carnal attitudes that they're demonstrating that they feel justifiable actually serving up a feast to the enemy who's cursed to crawl on his belly and eat dust. Thank you, Lord, for your loving spirit, for your gracious nature, for your gracious confrontation (laughs) that we so desperately need in our lives along the journey. Your word says that good Father in heaven corrects and disciplines those he loves. So help us, Lord, to take a step forward becoming more of who you've designed us to be and less of who the enemy tries to make us out to be. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. We're just in a really unique space right now. I just pray that our hearts, Lord, would be inclined to this place of experiencing your love and your grace, your presence throughout the entire course of this week. I pray, Lord, that we would just be willing to obey. Perhaps there's some people that you need to make a beeline to this morning, sometime this week, and just apologize. I'm sorry, I've been complaining and I shouldn't have something so powerful just about our willingness to admit that maybe in your marriage maybe in your workplace maybe somebody who's not even a Christian the incredible doorway that you could open just by saying I'm trying not to complain so much and I would appreciate if you'd call me on it in the name of Jesus ask you, let's take just a few moments. I really do believe this is not just something we do as a process of, you know, gathering, but it's part of our congregational assignment. Would you take whatever it is the Lord's doing in your heart right now, bring that into a little bit deeper place of worship, maybe than what you were experiencing when we first came in, with a little greater awareness of what the conversation of the Lord is in your life as we just press in and, and we worship the Lord before we're dismissed.